please join me in extending a very warm welcome to Chris Hedges. Thank you. All of the arguments that have been used capitalism are a lie. Um, the notion that trickle-down economics, empowering and enriching a tiny oligarchic elite uh, will somehow uh, ultimately create an acceptable standard of living for working men and women and even for the middle class is false. All of that said, we are also in a period that Antonio Gramsci called the interregnum, a period where we've lost faith, and this is across the political spectrum, in both the ideas and structures that once made a capitalist democracy possible, but we have yet to articulate another vision. So there's this disquiet, and uh, I quote in the book from Alexander Berkman's essay, Invisible Revolution, where he talks about that process whereby people lose faith in a system as being similar to water boiling in a kettle. So finally you hear the whistle, you see the steam, but you don't see that process of transformation. And I think that's clearly where we are at this moment. And you can statistically, I think, um, justify that argument by looking at a series of decisions that have been made in the last few years by the corporate state, and I would argue that we've undergone a corporate coup d'etat in slow motion, and it's over, they've won. Uh, but you can go back to the 2008 bailouts of the banks, and constituent calls in Congress were 100 to 1 against those bailouts across the political spectrum, and yet they passed anyway. Nobody wants the wholesale security and surveillance state the evisceration of our privacy, uh, and yet we're powerless to respond. Uh, there's no support for these endless wars in the Middle East. Uh, the most recent trade agreements, NAFTA, uh, TPP and CAFTA, uh, have seen this insane process whereby trade agreements that are going to radically reconfigure our own society, including destroying institutions such as the post office, are not allowed to be presented to the public. And even Bush allowed his trade agreements to be public beforehand. Um, and yet our elected representatives, those that are allowed to see the agreement, are not allowed to speak about it. And if they take notes, it's confiscated. So over and over, there are a series of policies that are implemented that have no popular support at all. Uh, we see it, I think, most dramatically in Black Lives Matter, where, and the Washington Post just ran a story a couple weeks ago, by the way, that said that all of the statistics that we have used about lethal force are incorrect. We were saying that uh, a citizen was being shot dead every 28 hours. They said, in fact, because it's all self-reporting, and much of it's not reporting at all, it's as many as two a day. So people march through the streets. I mean, we have this a uh, moment where one of our fellow citizens in the city of New York is strangled to death by New York City police officers and the police officers walk away. So people march in the streets, people respond, and yet they keep shooting over and over and over. So on, in big, small, large issues, um, the message has filtered down that we don't count. And uh, as long as that, in essence, political paralysis remains, the state continues in the name of austerity to extract larger and larger pounds of flesh, um, then eventually they'll, they will get blowback. That's, that's history, I think, has amply demonstrated that. Right. Um, I want to get into uh, several of the specific manifestations of the impressions of the corporate state that you focus on. But before I do, I want to follow up on something that you had said. You said that the people have lost faith 
in a system, and faith involves a certain element of, of subjectivity. Mm. And I'm wondering what the manifestations of that loss of faith are. I mean, we can talk about the the actions of the corporate state and the nature of its the impression, but on the ground, how do we know that people, in effect, are losing faith? I mean, I think of the what's the matter with Kansas right. phenomenon, where people are oppressed and yet seem to still vote for the Republican Party, right. uh, basically vote against their self-interest, seem to still manifest, if you look at the last elections, and presidential elections, manifest a faith in the system at some level. So when you talk about the, the, the loss of faith, how do, what are the empirical, what's the empirical evidence? For well, the fact that Congress has a 7% approval rating. Um, <laughs> Okay. You know, that's a pretty statistical right. <laughs> barometer. I take issue with uh, Frank's book, which I like in many ways, um, but I take issue with the notion that working men and women, by voting for the Republican Party, are voting against their interests. The Democratic Party sold out working men and women under Bill Clinton. And Bill Clinton did that quite consciously and cynically. Um, for corporate money. So it's under Clinton that you get NAFTA in 1994, the greatest betrayal of the working class since the Taft-Hartley Act of 1948. It's under Clinton that you get these draconian drug laws uh, which fill our prisons uh, with people who've never committed a violent crime. It's under Clinton that you get the 1994 Omnibus Crime Bill which swells the prison population from about 700,000 to over 2 million by the time he leaves. It's under Clinton that you get the destruction of welfare. And under our old system of welfare, 70% of the recipients were children. It's under Clinton that you get the deregulation of the FCC, which turns the airwaves over to the hands of a half dozen corporations. It's under Clinton that you get the destruction of Glass-Steagall, the 1933 Act that created firewalls between investment and commercial banks, which leads ultimately to the financial meltdown, the global and national financial meltdown. Uh, and Clinton had a kind of diabolical brilliance in that he, by the 90s, had fundraising parity, corporate money, with the Republican Party. But what he did was transform the Democratic Party into the Republican Party. I mean, the Democratic Party in Europe would be a far-right party. And he pushed the Republican Party so far to the right, they became insane. Um, but the idea that the Democratic Party rep it still speaks in that traditional feel your pain language of liberalism, and I spent a lot of time in death of liberal class, as you know, speaking about this. Um, but really, with the rise of Clinton, we have faux liberals. Uh, much like I saw in Yugoslavia, by the way. Uh, Yugoslavia, there are many similarities I see between uh, the war I covered in Yugoslavia and the situation where we are now, in the sense that you had a self-identified liberal elite after the death of Tito running a country that was unable to respond to uh, the increasing uh, difficulties that were imposed on the Yugoslav citizenry. And in the end, of, of course, they got hit in, in the late 80s with hyperinflation, but in the end, what happened, and this was also in, true in Weimar, is that a disgusted public turned on the self-identified liberal elites, but they also turned on, quote-unquote, liberal democratic values. And then you vomited up figures like Radovan Karadzic, uh, Franjo Tuzman, Slobodan Milosevic, in the same way that in Weimar you vomited up the Nazi party. So uh, I have long been a supporter of Nader, and in 2008 was, wrote Ralph's uh, policy speeches for him, and that was a very unpopular position to take in circles such as this one. Um, but I argued that it was kind of counterintuitive, that if there was a self-identified liberal class that was not able to effectively respond to the grievances and the injustices that were being visited on the poor, on working men and women, and increasingly on the middle class, the backlash would be terrifying and would come in the form of those powerful proto-fascist elements that have always existed in American society uh, going all the way back to the Klan. 
And you see it in the Tea Party, in militias, um, in the Christian right. Forces that direct a legitimate rage towards the vulnerable, which is what fascism always does. Muslims, undocumented workers, African Americans, homosexuals, liberals, intellectuals, feminists. And, and that's what I fear. Unfettered, unregulated capitalism, as Karl Marx understood, is a revolutionary force. It has no internal limits. It does what it's designed to do, which is exploit human beings, the natural world, until exhaustion or collapse. And it has no external limits. And that's why the environmental crisis is intimately twinned with the economic crisis. Mm -hmm. And we should not forget that Obama drills like Sarah Palin. He's just opened up the Arctic Sea to Shell, where they will drop half a billion dollar bits profiting off the death throes of the planet. Um, and I think that a proper understanding of configurations of power um, make this a moment in human history where we face what Immanuel Kant would call a radical evil. Um, these forces, in a quite literal sense, are forces of death. And there are no mechanisms now left within the systems of power to carry out the kind of incremental and piecemeal reform that were once possible in a capitalist democracy. And that's what makes our situation so frightening and so dramatic. Right. You said at the beginning, I want to follow up on this because this is crucial to the dynamics of rebellion, which your book is ultimately committed to. Um, and you stated that we're, we're in an interregnum. I mean, clearly you've, you've uh, begun to identify, I think, in, in very stark terms, uh, the oppression under which we all live. It's a type of iron cage. Yet we haven't yet reached the point where there is a consciousness, a, a, a broad-based consciousness of rebellion. So we're in that middle hmm. state. And you cite George Orwell, and what makes your book so rich is there are many literary and historical allusions that point to funnel into the current moment. But you mentioned George Orwell as stating that um, efficient, that uh, efficient totalitarian states, quote, create a climate in which people do not think, do not think of rebelling. So the question uh, I'm asking you, Chris, is can you explicate how our corporate state has inhibited, uh, diverted, preempted the consciousness of rebelling from emerging at this particular moment? Um, well, they've, 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 they've destroyed the mechanisms by which we opened up American democracy, and these are mass movements. And this is the brilliance of Howard Zinn's The People People's History of the United States, and as Joe knows, I uh, teach in prisons in New Jersey. And when you teach in a prison, you have to get your course approved by the prison administrators. So when you write up your course description, it's the opposite of writing up a course description for a course catalog in a college. You know, we'll watch lots of movies, class on the lawn, kind of stuff. Um, you have to write something utterly banal. So I sent in a description uh, saying American history, the three branches of government, our constitution, and it was approved and then I bought all of my students the people's history of the United States. <laughs> and that book is important because Zinn explains correctly that the American system was designed by a native aristocratic, oligarchic, white male, largely slave-holding class that feared popular democracy, feared direct democracy. And so not only did it disenfranchise women, African Americans, Native Americans, white males without property, but it appointed senators, it created the Electoral College, that's how you get the phenomena of Al Gore winning 500,000 more votes than George W. Bush, and yet George W. Bush being anointed by the Supreme Court as president, had nothing to do with Nader, by the way. Um, and so what happened throughout American history, which Zinn chronicles, is the rise of movements, none of which achieved positions of power, that opened up the space, often with the blood of working men and women. So the abolitionist movement, the Liberty Party that fought slavery, 
the labor movement and we had the bloodiest labor wars in the industrialized world. Hundreds of American workers were murdered. Tens of thousands were blacklisted. Um, the suffragists, the civil rights movement. And in the name of anti-communism, which really began at the end of World War I, because on the eve of World War I, these movements had essentially cornered the power elite. And we saw after the war a transition which Dwight MacDonald, a writer I like very much, was not read the way he should be, said, we, we moved at the end of the war into a state that none of the political theorists of the 19th century, including Karl Marx, had anticipated, and that was a state of permanent war, the psychosis of permanent war. So you are constantly attempting to ferret out internal enemies. And that's how you get the Palmer raids, uh, they closed down the masses, they closed down appeal to reason, which had the fourth highest circulation in the country, um, and they break radical anarcho-syndicalist unions like the Wobblies. And so, especially after the McCarthy hearings, and I recommend to you all Ellen Schrecker's two great books on the history of McCarthyism. Uh, one is called uh, No Ivory Tower, which is the purging of academic institutions, and the other I think is called Such Were the Crimes or something like that. But it, I, it, I learned a lot about McCarthyism that I didn't know. Uh, I didn't understand how extensive that purging was. So that FBI agents would walk into local high schools, they would have a list of four or six teachers that were soft on communism or reds without any evidence. They would be immediately expelled and blacklisted and wouldn't get any work. This was true through all professions. Uh, not just the artistic community, not just Hollywood journalism. Uh, and liberal institutions themselves, like the ACLU, were uh, purged internally. And so the destruction of the movements, coupled with the evisceration of those liberal institutions that had once made incremental and piecemeal reform possible, left us powerless. And what we have seen, especially since the 70s, is this shift of what the Harvard historian Charles Mayer calls you know, our transformation from an empire of production to an empire of consumption, meaning that we began to borrow, to maintain both a lifestyle and an empire that we could no longer afford. And at that point, we, all of the mechanisms which Zinn had highlighted by which we had opened up our democracy atrophy and closed. And that's, of course, now we are watching in the name of austerity, um, this backwards policy whereby the big banks and financial firms like Goldman Sachs, which carried out documented fraud, um, bilking you know, pension funds and city funds and retirement counts and of staggering amounts of money are bailed out. And the citizen, in the name of austerity, is forced to pay the bill. So if you look at St. Louis County, 30 to 40 percent of the revenue, this is not unusual in poor counties, is extracted from the poorest of the poor through fines. And the list of fines are absurd. I mean, you're fined for not mowing your lawn. You're fined, you can be fined in Ferguson for standing on a street corner for more than five seconds. I'm not making that up. And that's why and poor people can't pay those fines, so then there become warrants, and that's why when your car gets stopped, because you don't have a tail light, you run. Because if they grab you, you're going to prison. And what's the response of a militarized police force is you're shot in the back and killed. So we have reached a point by which the most vulnerable, and I would argue if you really want to see the goal of the corporate state, look in the prison system. Because there you see defenseless people and defenseless families who have no ability to resist being increasingly squeezed for money. Uh, phone rates five or six times higher than what any of us in this room pay. Money transfer rates. You transfer $20 through JPay, you pay $4.95 fee. You get into a prison in New Jersey, you don't get shoes. You've got to buy your shoes. You're only making $28 a month. Um, you're charged for medical, you're charged for legal, 
and then they, there's all sorts of fines they can inflict on you if you want to if you want a, to visit a relative, a, a member of your nuclear family who is, has either died or is dying, you get a 15 minute visa, you have to pay overtime to the guards, it costs you $900. So you're getting, now we're seeing people released from the prison system in debt. And remember, these people can work 30 years in prison, they have no social security. And they get out, and if they can't pay those fines, they're right back in. So that's why we're seeing large numbers of corporations moving back into the prison system. And you can, you know, Target, Victoria's Secret, Starbucks, Johnson & Johnson, Hewlett Packard, there's lists, dozens of them, a million workers. Uh, and they're earning what sweatshop workers earn in Bangladesh, 22 cents an hour, 45 cents an hour. I just got a phone call, as I write on the prisons, I got a phone call on a week ago, Friday, and it's from uh, a leader of the Free Alabama movement who's in solitary confinement, has been in solitary confinement for the last 18 months. And he and two other figures had uh, triggered a work stoppage, which I believe is now the only way to break the back of neo-slavery that is the prison system. Because if the state has to pay compensated labor or if they have to pay fair wages, the system of neo-slavery breaks down. And he had gotten some, well, from a death row inmate had mailed him an article of mine and given him my phone number. And so he called me on a, on a contraband cell phone and uh, just to talk. And I said, well, let me get my tape recorder. And I wrote a column about it a week ago. And, and he said, well, let me get the other two other brothers who led the movement on the conference call. Talking about prisons, you do mention briefly the phenomenon of privately owned prisons, which seems to me um, the Corrections Corporation of America, I think, is one of the largest uh, um, capitalist enterprises that owns prisons. It seems to me that by privatizing the prison system, uh, if we're talking about reform, not only are we talking about the politics of it, but indeed we, we come up against the, the juggernaut of corporate capitalism and the profit, profit motive, which diminishes even further the capacity right. for significant reform. Well, that's the problem. That You've nailed the problem. because. Now, prison has become so lucrative as a business. And not just, the private prison industry is a $90 billion a year industry, but it's not just that. Um, corporations control everything within the prison, um, you know, in terms of the daily life of the prisoners. And I think this really gets to a point that Marx understood that when you, um, create a body of surplus labor, redundant labor, uh, there's no way that the state can profit off of black and brown bodies when they're just wandering around East New York. But put them in a cage and they generate forty or fifty thousand dollars a year. That is the fundamental point of the system. Um, Neo-slavery is the engine that drives mass incarceration, which is why nationwide work stoppages within the prison system is the only way to counter um, or break the back of the system, which requires students, or you know, I call them my students, but you know, the, requires people within the prison to rise up, which is, and what happens is every time you find leaders like the leaders of the Free Alabama movement, they are immediately extracted and removed from the population because of their leadership quality. So they've been sitting in solitary. And solitary in Alabama, by the way, means no TV and no reading material, not even newspapers or magazines. And solitary in Alabama, uh, although you're supposed to get an hour out a day, means three days a week you might get out for one hour. They don't even have tables in those cells. They have to eat sitting on their steel toilet. And if you want to find out what it's like to be in solitary, go home this weekend and lock yourself in your bathroom for 48 hours. Um, w you know, Britain puts three to four people a year in solitary. We have tens of thousands of people. And I, you know, I, 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 when I teach, as Boris will tell you, every course I teach in the prison is really all themed the same thing, which is revolt. Um, so this spring I taught a course on conquest, and I taught open veins of Latin America, there is a benefit to an illiterate society. Uh, open veins of Latin America, bury my heart at Wounded Knee, and CLR James is the Black Jacobins on the Haitian slave revolt. 
and I handed out my syllabus. And this is kind of an important point for the book, actually. So I handed out my syllabus, and there was a Wednesday in March that I wasn't there because I had to give a, a lecture in Montana. And I'm in my hotel room in Montana, and I get a phone call. And the voice on the other end says, this is the Special Investigations Division of the Department of Corrections of New Jersey. Do you know the students, your students, just led a sit-down strike in the prison? And we think you're behind it. So your ability to enter the prison has been revoked, and you will have to schedule a meeting with the SID, which I did. Um, it was a Wednesday afternoon. Uh, I didn't know if I was going to get back in. I didn't have my, I was, you know, on, not on the list. Unfortunately for, or fortunately for me, unfortunately for them, as a foreign correspondent, I've been interviewed by many dumb cops throughout my career, and the game is just you're dumber than the cop. Um, and after an hour and a half, I was given my credentials back, went into my classroom. And what was so powerful for me about that moment is that all of those who carried out that strike knew what would be done to them. They knew their cells would be strip searched, they knew they would be interrogated, they knew that they would be threatened with being removed from the college program in the prison, they would be threatened with solitary, the leaders would be found out as they were and shipped down to Southwoods, which is a prison in southern New Jersey, which might as well be in Mississippi. All the guards are white. Uh, many are members of the Aryan Brotherhood. We just had a prisoner beaten to death by the guards. His body was returned to his family in Trenton. I saw pictures of it. His face filled with contusions, broken bones. And they were told he was 28 years old. They were told that he died of a heart attack. And the family said, we want an autopsy. And they said, autopsies cost $4,000. And all we have are the pictures, and he's buried. And I walked into that room, and those students were in shock because of, and yet they rose up anyway. And that gets, I think, to the heart of the book. Right. That rising up, even in a system as kind of totalitarian, and prisons are almost perfect totalitarian systems, I actually think they're very similar to slave plantations, um, was a moral imperative. It was about not what you could achieve, but what resistance allowed you to become as a human being. And I was, I mean, I'll be honest, I mean, when, they, when I got off the phone in that hotel room in Montana, I just sat there and wept and wept and wept. And I thought, what courage, what courage, what integrity among people who are so demonized, so forgotten, so ignored. I mean, and I think, you know, Boris is one of my students here, will confirm, and I'm not saying that there aren't people who don't deserve in, be in prison. I mean, there are, but there aren't, we're talking about maybe 10% or less. You run into that. People who sink to this level, and yet, in the face of absolutely unbelievable oppression, have this capacity to affirm themselves as human beings. And I think that gets to exactly the heart of the book. Right. Um, since we're talking about prisons, Chris, you had mentioned before we began that one of your students actually is here this evening and you wanted to invite him to come forward. Well, if, if you ask me a question I can't answer, I'm not going to try and speak for, <laughs> but we'll haul Boris up to. Right. Yeah. Who is that? Why don't you? Right there. Right. Yeah. yeah. Is there anything you want to add before we go on? No, no, no. Okay. okay. Is he a good teacher? Is he, is he a good teacher? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he is. Okay, good. Well, that's good to know. Okay, very good. Um, there are other forms of specific forms of oppression of the corporate state that you, that you discuss at length. Um, and uh, I was wondering if you could tell us, and of course this is in the news, uh, bring it closer to the current moment, um, how in effect uh, do you feel our fundamental freedoms, I'm talking about political mm -hmm. freedoms, have been suppressed and, as you put it, our constitution emasculated? Well, this is what's happened. I mean, the judiciary has essentially, through judicial fiat, removed or taken from us our most basic constitutional rights. 
by reinterpreting the Constitution. So the ability of corporations to infuse unlimited cash into the election cycle is reinterpreted as the right to petition the government. The courts have refused to respond to the documented stripping away of our right to privacy. Um, as some of you know, I sued Barack Obama in federal court here in New York in the Southern District Court of New York over Section 1021 of the National Defense Authorization Act. Section 1021 authorizes the U.S. military to arrest U.S. citizens, and remember this is another violation of the Constitution, the use of the military as a domestic police force, to seize American citizens who quote-unquote substantially support, that's not a legal term, that's not material support, the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, or something called associated forces, which is another nebulous term. Strip them of due process and hold them indefinitely, or in the language of that section, until the end of hostilities in military detention centers. And Judge Catherine B. Forrest, to her credit, ruled that this was unconstitutional. And in her 112-page opinion, which is worth reading, she said this opens the way for the government to criminalize an entire class of people. And she brings up the internment of 110,000 Japanese Americans in World War II. Now what was interesting is that in the midst of this lawsuit, they ran an opinion poll and it had a 97% disapproval rating. And this gets back to the point. But it passes anyway. As we were carrying out this lawsuit, we went to Pelosi's office, the lawyers, Carl Mayer and Bruce Afron and I. And we said, we'll drop the lawsuit if you will just write into this section that this does not apply to U.S. citizens. And of course, they would not do it because it was written for U.S. citizens. And it was written because they know what's coming. And they finally, I believe, don't trust the police to protect them. And so what happened is that when Judge Forrest made her ruling, not only did the federal attorneys, but attorneys representing the NSA and national security appeared in her chambers and said, you must lift the temporary injunction in the name of national security. And she refused. That was on a Friday afternoon. At 9 a.m., they went to the Second Circuit or the Appellate Court, made the same request. And they did lift the injunction. And this gets back to how the courts essentially have taken our constitutional rights by fiat. So the Second Circuit now is forced to rule. They have the hearing. They don't rule for months. And what they're doing is watching another case called Clapper versus Amnesty International, which I was also a plaintiff, where we challenged the FISA Amendment Act. It got to the Supreme Court. The government lawyer stood up in the court and said that I and the other plaintiffs, the charge that we were under surveillance was quote unquote speculation, and that if the government was carrying out surveillance against us, we would be informed. And the court bought it and threw it out. And then the Second Circuit said, well, Hedges does not have standing in Clapper versus Amnesty International. Therefore, he does not have standing, a right to bring the case in Hedges versus Obama and its law. But we have seen over and over and over a system. I mean, at this point, the, corporate, the, the court system is a wholly owned subsidiary of the corporate state. And all of the traditional mechanisms by which we were once able to influence centers of power have been effectively taken from us, which gets back to those mechanisms that Zinn pointed out, mass movements, civil disobedience, and we're seeing the brush fires of that in the fight to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour in Black Lives Matter, uh, the debt jubilee, I mean, the anti-fracking movement, but it is going to require that we step outside of the traditional mechanisms and recreate those mechanisms which were fundamental to opening up our democracy. So I was in Boston recently 
and I had dinner with anti-fracking activists, and you know they're running pipelines uh, down through Roslindale, Kinder Morgan, and Spectre. These are bitumen tar sands. And they have been sending petitions to Markey and to Warren, and it's not, nothing's working. And I said, you have to stop the petitions. Uh, the only thing you have to do now is go out and buy old junk cars, and when the construction equipment arrives on those streets to build those pipelines, you have to drive the cars into the street, take the battery out, and walk away. That's all we have left. And we are, you know, if we talk about climate change, we have no time left. If we do not obstruct these forces, then we, we are robbing our children and our children's children of a sustainable future. Right. Um, much of the book is devoted to issues of environmentalism and control of corporate state over the environment. And I'm wondering if you can say a little bit more about that in terms of other examples, and other mechanisms of control. Um, well, I, I think it's all part of one package um, in that unfettered capitalism will squeeze human capital, the natural world, until there's nothing left and that that's what they do, that's what they're designed to do. Which means that if we are to create something that's sustainable, we have to radically reconfigure our relationship to each other and to the natural world. And I think that we're seeing this in Greece. You know, Greece represents, what, 3% of the EU economy? It's not enough to worry about. But what's happening between the international banking system and Greece has nothing to do with economics and everything to do with politics. It is a political battle. Because if the Greeks successfully walk away from the Euro, then Spain is next, and probably Ireland, and everything begins to unravel. So what I suspect, and I mean, we're, we're literally, the banks are closed, the runs on the banks. If Cyprus and Cereza is not able to make a deal, then what I think we will see is what we saw in 1973 in Chile, where the international banking system, as they destroyed Allende, will attempt to destroy Cereza. So that's fuel shortages, power outages, food shortages, um, until the government is uh, discredited in the eyes of the wider population the way Allende was. And you present a Pinochet type figure who will do the bidding of the Chicago school and, and neoliberal econ economists. Um, but if, if Greece makes it, then um, I mean, revolutions, as I talk about in that book, come in waves. That's not my idea. You know, a lot of historians have written about that. The, the kind of tsunami type effect could be quite dramatic. I want to get into some other subjects that you raised that um, are part of the analysis, but not quite at the dead center of it, perhaps. Although, as you said, it's all unified into, into a single package. You have an entire chapter on the history of vigilantism yeah. in the United States. And I found that that was most intriguing and perhaps in some sense a very creative um, analysis. How has our history of violence and vigilante violence served the interests of corporate power? America has, and I have to pay credit to Hofstetter because you know he's the one who really kind of made this point, which I pick up on, but America has a very peculiar tradition. We don't have a revolutionary tradition, with the exception of Thomas Paine. Uh, and he didn't come to the United States until he was 37. And of course, was roundly rejected by the founding fathers once they achieved power. Paine was an abolitionist. We didn't have the word socialist maybe then, but he was certainly a socialist. And what America has is a long history of armed white groups that carry out horrific acts of violence against minorities, 
radicals, and dissidents. So you see some of the worst massacres in westward expansion were not carried out by the U.S. cavalry. They were carried out by rogue militias out of Denver, the Sand Creek Massacre and the death of murder of Black Kettles, uh, Sioux Tribe was, were all militias. Uh, the slave patrols, uh, the White Leagues, um, the Red Shirt Brigades, these are all vigilante groups, uh, the Pinkertons, the gun, these gun thugs who worked for uh, coal companies and steel companies, uh, Baldwin Feltz, and we see it today in the Tea Party militias. This is, this is why gun ownership in the United States is so high, um, and it's largely in the hands of white men. It's largely criminalized. You know, you can get a gun as a black male in the United States, but if you do, you're going to be breaking the law. If you are a white male, you can legally get a gun. We've largely criminalized gun ownership for blacks. And in times of turmoil, these vigilante groups direct their animus towards those who are defined as unpatriotic uh, and not against the government. That's been our tradition. And with the weakening of populist movements, what I worry about as we face disintegrating effects of climate change and economic stagnation and potentially another meltdown is that these move, the backlash will come from these vigilante groups. Uh, a kind of, you know, classically fascist backlash. Um, you saw it with Clyde Bundy. I mean, if all of those people showing up with shotguns and automatic weapons on Clyde Bundy's ranch had been black, um, they would not have walked away unscathed, or if they had come from Earth first or anywhere else. And that has been part of our DNA, which makes it frightening. America is a very, very, very violent culture. And, and in times of distress, that will be part of the expression of dissent. I want to ask you a historical point. It's really a very small one in your book, but it caught my, caught my attention because uh, about a year ago, I started after the Newtown um, uh, event. I had started a, in Burton County, where I live, a uh, gun violence prevention coalition, which is still very active. And it's been my pleasure, if I can call it that, to actually debate Second Amendment advocates, although I really wouldn't call them debates, right, in that regard. But a point that they frequently raised was that the Nazis had basically taken the guns away. In other words, their argument for defending gun ownership is one of insurrection against the totalitarian and fascist state. That's why we need our guns. And you make a very interesting point, which I did not know, was that the Communist Party in Germany under the fascist regime actually was very well armed yeah. and it did not make any difference. Which right. I think is a very, you've given me, if I can use a bad pun, some ammunition against the Second Amendment types when I get involved. Well, you know who wrote about, you know who wrote about this was Engels. Uh -huh. And Engels, I can't remember, but he, he, it, it was after Marx had died and he wrote an essay, I can't remember the name of it, but he writes about the machine gun. And he said that it was, the invention of the machine gun that doomed violent revolts. Mm -hmm. Because before, in the French Revolution, it was musket against musket. Right. But now you had weapon systems that were fo far, so far superior to what the masses could acquire right. that there was no contest. Right. And, you know, I lived in Yugoslavia during the war. Everybody had AK-47s. Uh, I can tell you that when a well-trained, heavily armed SWAT team surrounds your house, um, you may like to think that you'll run out with your shotgun, but you will run out with your hands up. Uh, and I saw that in Iraq, I've seen it in the Middle East, everywhere else. The idea that you're going to grab your weapon and fight off is John Wayne fantasy. And what happens with those weapons is what always happens, is that they're largely used to shoot people who shouldn't be shot. Right. Um, I have a few more questions that uh, deal with the 
the dynamic of rebellion, and then I want to open it up to um, our audience. I'm sure people have questions of their own. And um, the question I have is actually a two-part question. Um, and that is, when we talk about the dynamics of rebellion, and maybe, I'm, Chris, I'm being slightly contentious here, if I may be, um, you uh, basically paint the portraits primarily of individual actors whose consciousness has been raised and who in some ways are rebelling against or sabotaging the system. And yet when I think of revolutions, I think of group organization, I think of vanguard groups that are very well organized and that sort of lead uh, the masses in revolutionary action. And um, I, in your book, I don't see, except for the Occupy movement, which was deliberately, in some ways, did not want to create a hierarchy of organization. I'm wondering whether um, what you see as the dynamics, that is, individual actors, eventually have to coalesce into group action, or how you see this, if I, I'm asking you to be a profitable bit, to how it plays itself out. And having asked that question, maybe that's a good lead-in to some of the individuals, and I leave it up to you to choose them. You have certain individuals like Chelsea Manning, uh, that interesting fundamentalist in Alberta who is sabotaging wells that are involved in fracking, and there are other people, uh, Jamal in prison, and, right, Abu uh, Jamal. Mumia. And uh, Mumia, yeah, in, in prison, and several other individuals. So maybe if you can first answer the first question of, of, of whether we need group action, or vanguard, organization to lead a revolutionary change, uh, which, by the way, you see, as I have to mention this, as nonviolent. Right. Uh, revolutions, revolutions, are, revolutions are always nonviolent. And we talk about the American Revolution, but it wasn't a revolution. It was a classic war against colonialism. And when you throw off a colonial power, violence is often the tool, only tool open to you. That's what we saw throwing the French out of Algeria. That's what we saw in Vietnam. But revolutions are nonviolent, and even the Re Russian Revolution. So the uh, Cossacks are sent in to quell the bread riots in Petrograd. They refuse to fire on the crowd. In fact, they join the crowd. Uh, the, the Tsar's ministers frantically call him back from the front. He abdicates on a railway siding. Um, that was true in Cuba. Once Bautista fled the army wouldn't fight. That was true in Iran. 79, the Shah flees, the best equipped, best trained, it's all our money, all our training, they lay down their weapons. It was true in Nicaragua when Carter turns the three ships with weapons back and the National Guard won't defend Samosa. Uh, it was true in the revolutions I covered in Eastern Europe where uh, Eric Honecker in the fall of 1989 sends down an elite paratroop division to fire on the protesters in Leipzig. They refuse. Honecker, who'd been in power for 19 years, is out within a week. And I quote the great revolutionary theorists Jeffrey Davies and Crane Brinton in the book, who make the point that no revolution succeeds until a significant portion of the organs of internal security either defect, and this was true in the French Revolution, or refuse to fight to defend a discredited elite. That's how revolutions succeed. And we have to go back to Havel, his 1978 essay, The Power of the Powerless, where he talks about living in truth. And I covered the Velvet Revolution. I was in the Magic Lantern Theater every night with Havel, with Dinsbeer, with Klaus, all the people who would inherit power in post-communist Czechoslovakia. So revolutions are nonviolent. In terms of the other question that you raise about a vanguard, right. Revolutions are spontaneous events. Even Lenin concedes this. And remember, six weeks before the Russian Revolution, Lenin's giving a talk in Switzerland, and he says, those of us who are old will never see the revolution. This is six weeks before he's shipped by the Kaiser in a sealed railway carriage um, to Russia. Nobody knows, and I've covered these, you, they have a kind of spontaneous life of their own. I mean, you, you can see that the tinder is there, but what sets it off, you never know. And, and having covered those movements, I, I've watched, I've, because I was working for the New York Times, I was with the leadership, like Djindjic and Draskovic during the Serbian uprising. I was literally with them, in the room with them. And I was watching them frantically trying to gauge the emotions of the crowds. Because it's, 
it takes on a life of its own and leaders read those emotions they don't direct them so I was in Leipzig on November 9, 1989 with the leaders of the East German uprising in the afternoon and they said maybe within a year we will have free passage back and forth across the Berlin Wall within a few hours the Berlin Wall at least as an impediment to human traffic did not exist even they had no idea it was a very important lesson for me what happens is that spontaneous uprising you saw it with the rise of the Soviets I mean the, the Russian Revolution was largely an anarchist driven revolution and the Bolsheviks which did have a disciplined vanguard essentially in October carried out a coup d'etat right. uh, a right-wing deviation a form of state capitalism a counter-revolution and that's the danger of violence because when you in, inje inject a violent entity and the you know the Red Guard were created as a kind of paramilitary force loyal to the Bolshevik party uh, then, then revolutions become prey. So even in the Cuban Revolution, it, were, was, it was the student strikes, the labor strikes. Castro wasn't in Havana. He had to shove his barbudos in trucks and drive for a few days to get there. But of course he came in with the guns and the credibility by which he was able to take power. And that's how revolutions become hijacked. And that's why violence is so dangerous. Mm -hmm. Because once you use violence, um, you, you create two extremes, the state terrorism versus, in essence, the terrorism of an insurgent force, and the large middle is, is caught in between. Right. So, I mean, if, if this was Russia, I would be Kerensky. And Kerensky was destroyed because Kerensky had two goals. I mean, Kerensky did not want to execute the Tsar and his family. Kerensky wanted a kind of social democracy, which, by the way, the Bolsheviks began as socialists. They began and then split with the Mensheviks. And you're kind of doomed at that point if you have to confront a Lenin, who, you know, read Kropotkin on Lenin, who is utterly amoral and will use anything, uh, including widespread assassinations in order to achieve power so that's how revolutions go bad and many many revolutions have gone bad um, and that's why it's incumbent upon us to try and build movements that are nonviolent um, and that remain nonviolent you saw it by with solidarity in Poland so after uh, solidarity was broken and they reimposed martial law you had a faction within solitary that split away and decided to create an armed uprising and there's a famous story of Valencia and other solitary leaders finding out where the arms cache was and breaking into the warehouse or the house and throwing all the weapons in the river um, and that's what we have to do um, but if we descend if we continue in a kind of deterioration um, and the state is quite happy to speak in the language of violence you know all you have to do is look at Ferguson where they're rolling tanks out on the street against unarmed. That's what they do really well. Um, but at that point, we're doomed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, towards the end of the book, you quote the Protestant theologian Reinhold Niebuhr as uh, stating that the disposition of the rebel partakes of, quote, of sublime madness. Can you explain what you mean by sublime madness? Yeah, Niebuhr, who I admire very much, um, said that in moments of extremity, what Kant would call radical evil, liberal forces are an ineffectual force. They're too intellectual, too little emotional to respond. And that it's only those who are endowed with this quality of what he calls sublime madness. You see it with the Zapatistas. So they declare NAFTA, and seven people go off to the Yucatan, I think there were only six or seven people in an attempt to start a rebellion. You see it with many of the figures that I interview in the book. Julian Assange, um, Mumia Abu-Jamal, um, 
Lynn Stewart, the great civil rights attorney, was released from a 10-year sentence because she has advanced cancer. Ronnie Casrills, who founded the armed wing of the ANC with Nelson Mandela. And, and Casrills makes a really interesting point and is kind of emblematic of the rebel because he said, you know, he's white and he's Jewish. So after the Sharpeville massacre, he decides to join the underground ANC movement with Mandela. And whites were not allowed to be in the township after 10 p.m. And he said it was after 10 p.m. that he walked out on his entire life. Um, and he said, in that sense, I was a rebel because I defied my own. He said Mandela was a revolutionary. But Casrils embodies that quality of the rebel in, in that a rebel, once the rebel is in power, becomes a heretic. Because they're just, it's within their DNA. They're, they don't compromise. So Kasrils is the deputy defense minister, and he immediately does what Milovan Gilas did in the former Yugoslavia, in the Yugoslavia under Tito, which is denounce the ruling elite. Gilas wrote this book called The New Class, which saw Tito throw him in prison. Kasrils denounces the corruption within the ANC, and then when they fire on those miners who were striking, the largest uh, massacre of laborers since Sharpeville, he denounces the party that he had spent 30 years underground serving. He embodies the rebel. Rebels like Che Guevara, they're not effective in terms of rulers, in t once power is achieved, um, but they're absolutely vital, as Niebuhr points out, as tinder to push any kind of revolt forward. So they're very, I think Assange for me, who I've spent a lot of time with in the embassy in Ecuador and London, embodies this. I mean, he's been fighting systems of power since he was 14 or 15 years old. And these are difficult, eccentric, uncompromising, ornery people who I kind of love and admire. Um, and, and they're very, very important in moments because they have that capacity to stand up in the face of overwhelming power. And we have to remember that when you look throughout history, most rebels don't succeed. We remember the ones that do. But most of them are crushed. Most of them are destroyed. And yet they stand up anyway. And it is that sublime madness, that kind of moral imperative that is, that is vital. Right. Well, conjoined with that, and I want to conclude my, my portion of the evening. I think I could do no better than to really read the last paragraph of your book. Because I, I think it's, it's beautiful and uh, it made me really appreciate it, uh, your Pulitzer well, Prize for nothing, let me, let me put it that way. You say, quote, I do not know if we can build a better society. I do not even know if we will survive as a species. But I do know that these corporate forces have us by the throat. And they have my children by the throat. I do not fight fascists because I will win. I fight fascists because they are fascists. And this is a fight that in the face of the overwhelming forces against us requires that we follow those possessed by sublime madness, that we become stone catchers and find in acts of rebellion the sparks of life, an intrinsic meaning that lies outside the possibility of success. We must grasp the harshness of reality at the same time as we, we refuse to allow this reality to paralyze us. People of all creeds and people of no creeds must make an absurd leap of faith to believe, despite all the empirical evidence around us, that the good draws to it the good. The fight for life goes somewhere. The Buddhists call it karma. And in these acts, we make possible a better world, even if we cannot see one emerging around us. That's absolutely beautiful, Chris. Thank you. Let's thank him for the Okay, friends, it's, uh, it's about 10 after 8. Let's, uh, let's spend another half an hour together, okay? If people have questions, we have mics on both sides. Looking for a bit of optimism, my question is going to reflect that. Uh, there seems to be some evidence that modern technology, cell phones, social media, 
in this country is already contributing to positive social activism change nonviolently. Uh, so I'm not interested in my opinion. I'm interested in your opinion about whether you see growth and opportunity in, in those developments. Thank you. I think social media is in, in some ways, but in many ways, a curse. It is certainly a very effective tool in terms of mobilizing. We saw that in the Occupy movement. But it also allows the corporate state to disseminate these electronic hallucinations constantly, especially over handheld devices that atomize individuals, essentially destroy the possibility to create communal entities. So if you're sitting in your room typing angry diatribes on your Facebook page, you're still sitting alone in your room, which is just where the corporate state wants you. I think the problem with social media, and we certainly have seen it among a generation that's been raised on social media, is that they've been fragmented from each other. And this was part of the power of the Occupy movement, and many of you were probably there, that it recreated a communal space that wasn't commercial, and that was directed around democracy, education. I mean, after the destruction of Zuccotti, one of the things that moved me was how so many people mourned for the People's Library, where we had 5,000 books and retired New York City librarians trying to catalog them. It was, a, it was always my favorite part of the park. And, and you know what the NYPD is, they dumped those books on the road and ran over them with dump trucks. They destroyed it, consciously. And I think that we have to recreate communal structures if we're going to effectively resist. And social media oftentimes contributes, I think, to that, what Hannah Aaron calls that atomization. Social media also is, caters to the cult of the self. You know, Instagram, Facebook, it's kind of advertisements for me. The other problem I have with the internet and social media is that it disrupts the possibility of thought, of profound thought. Um, we have to create walls. I don't tweet, I don't have a Facebook page, I don't have a web page, I don't have a television, because I try and read two, three, four hours a day. You can't understand capitalism if you don't read Karl Marx's first volume of Capital. You're never going to get that off the internet. And Chomsky, who obviously admire very much, makes a very good point. He said, you can have what passes for an intellectual discussion as long as you stay within accepted parameters. Because in essence, you're speaking in identifiable cliches. But as soon as you challenge those cliches, as soon as you attempt to dissect those structures, you need time because you're leading a person into uncharted and unfamiliar territory. And I think part of the problem is that if we don't understand mechanisms of power, and that only comes by essentially rooting ourselves in a print-based culture, the culture of ideas, then we are rendered largely defenseless because we respond to the personalities, the political personalities that are manufactured for us. Obama is a classic example. And, and I, this is, I, it's a book I never tire of promoting, but it's important, an important book. It's by Sheldon Woolen, who is our greatest living political philosopher, uh, taught at Berkeley and Princeton for many years and wrote Politics and Vision, which is the great classic on Western political thought, but also wrote a book called Democracy Incorporated, which gave me the language to understand our system of what he calls inverted totalitarianism. And that's not classical 
totalitarianism. It doesn't find its expression through a demagogue or a charismatic leader, but through the anonymity of the corporate state. So that in a classical totalitarian regime, you have uh, you know, forces that overthrow a structure. In, in inverted totalitarianism, these corporate forces purport to pay fealty to electoral politics, the Constitution, the iconography and language of American patriotism, and yet internally have seized all the levers of power. And uh, the Lannan Foundation, like, he's not been interviewed for years. In the 1980s, he used to write, he's a beautiful writer, he used to write for the New York Review of Books, and, uh, and in the 1980s, with the rise of neoliberalism, he called it out for what it was, which was a con game. And he was completely pushed out and became a pariah within the political department at Princeton, which isn't much of a surprise, actually. And he'd not been interviewed for perhaps a decade. We went out and found him in a retirement home. He's 92 or 93, uh, an hour outside of Portland. And watch it. Uh, it's on YouTube. Um, we didn't know what to expect, and I could hardly keep up with this guy. And I was not going to dumb it down. It's Nietzsche and Marx and Kant and Weber, and it is, you know, what the world of letters should be. And, and, and if we had a functioning system of public television and public radio, the voices we should hear, but we don't. But maybe could you just go further with your answer into the tactics that the youth, uh, the student bodies of our universities and our general citizenry can do to fight and reverse this encroachment of corporate power and adding to that, do you see any uh, countries around the world where citizenry within are successfully resisting and perhaps reversing this? Do you, do you see hope in different nations around the world that we can perhaps look to or emulate? And then going further with those tactics that we can employ. In Spain, uh, you have 25% unemployment. I think youth employment, unemployment is at 50%. And they surrounded the Spanish Parliament, remember, a couple years ago, the indignados. And that's the kind of stuff we have to do. Um, we have to carry out sustained and massive acts of civil disobedience to, in the same way that these acts were carried out in Eastern Europe. I was in Alexanderplatz in East Berlin, 500,000 people. I was in Wenceslas Square, again, four or 500,000 people, night after night after night. The authorities call on the foot soldiers who protect them to use coercion to break these movements. They refuse, and these regimes are finished. So I think those are the kinds of models that we have to begin to replicate. Uh, I mean, look, con if Congress has a 7% approval rating, uh, there should be 93% of us surrounding Congress when they come into session, letting them know what we think of them. Credo of the New York Times is do not significantly alienate those on whom we depend for access and money. So clear. Thank you. I know Bernie Sanders has emerged in the Democratic Party as uh, somebody who looks like a real Democrat. I'm wondering if he has a chance against Hillary and Obama and these um, betrayal centrists <laughs> that betrayed us. Is there any hope? I mean, a lot of people are looking to him for real leadership. He's broken the mold by which traditional presidential candidates campaign, which is about this manufactured personality, you know, where they, they get us to connect and we confuse how we are made to feel about a candidate with knowledge. It's anti-politics, of course but it's been quite effective, and Obama was the master of it, which is why, after he won, Advertising Age gave Obama its top annual award, which is Marketer of the Year. He beat Apple, Zappos, Nike. The professionals understood very well what he had done. But Sanders should not have run as a Democrat, because the Democratic Party is part of the problem, and he's giving legitimacy to the Democratic Party. Furthermore, he has promised that he will support the Democratic nominee, who I think, unless there's a miracle, is going to be Hillary Clinton. And so in the end, by next April, he will funnel passion, energy, and money back into a dead political system. And then I have a very personal problem with Sanders, and that's over Israel-Palestine. 
because I spent so much of my life in Gaza. I just can't sell out the Palestinian people as he has. Um, I think that we have to build a movement that doesn't pick and choose the oppressed. I think we have to stand with all of the oppressed or none of the oppressed. And the refusal to speak out on behalf of the Palestinian people is one that resonates beyond our borders and discredits us. Um, you know, in Europe, I mean, they see that. So all of those are my issues with Sanders. I mean, Sanders, you know, I did an event with Bernie and Bill McKibben and Naomi Klein and Shama Sawan, whose campaign I just kicked off, a re-election campaign in, uh, uh, in Seattle. And we asked Sanders why he wouldn't run as an independent, which is what he should have done. And he said, I don't want to end up like Nader. And he's right. I mean, he would have, the Democratic Party would have destroyed him. He would have been stripped of his committee chairmanships. They would have made sure he was defeated in Vermont. Uh, and yet, I think that now we have to step outside the system and we have to understand that political campaigns, because the game's rigged. I mean, I worked closely up with Ralph in 2008 to see how it's rigged. But we have to build political campaigns that are a political expression of a movement and, and that don't end on election day, but that go into feeding the movement. So, Ten years ago in Greece, Sarasa only pulled 4%, which is about what Ralph pulled in 2000. And that's what we have to do. We have to funnel all of our energy into, into movements. I'm not a political you know, analyst. I don't, so I'm not a guru on elections. Um, I think you know, he may do well in New Hampshire, but Bill Curry, who writes for Salon, who's pretty smart on all this stuff, who I just talked to the other day. I don't think anybody who really understands the system thinks that Hillary is going to get taken down by Bernie Sanders. Um, but, you know, this is not, I don't spend my life following the ins and outs of the Democratic primaries. At the beginning of the evening, the, one of the first ideas that was discussed was, was the fact that we were at a revolutionary moment. I believe that was the expression. And I don't remember the exact words after, afterwards, correct me if I've misunderstood this, but the idea then was floated that we're, there's a lot of discontent and disillusionment throughout the country, but we don't quite know as a nation what's next. And I, am I correct in remembering that idea? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then the, you know, the phrase came to my mind that we're all familiar with, that there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. And it seems like, even though there have been all kinds of creative uh, things brought forward about what a non-dystopian future would be, nevertheless, it just it hasn't clicked yet. We, we all know we need something different, or many of us do, but we don't know what that is. I'd like, my question is, do you have a feeling for if we find our way through past all these problems, difficulties that we've discussed tonight, do you have a feeling for what that non-dystopian future might be? And the idea that you construct a society around the dictates of the marketplace is lunacy. Um, it's never been done in human history. It doesn't work. Uh, it, it creates an oligarchic elite, as we have done, a form of neo-feudalism which destroys the possibility of democracy. Aristotle made this point. And he said that with the rise of an oligarchy, you have two options, tyranny or revolt. And we have seen over the last few years the corporate state put into place physical and legal mechanisms that criminalize any form of dissent. And we have created by, and, and we'll go back to Hannah Arendt's The Origins of Totalitarianism, uh, where she writes about the stateless. She herself, of course, is stateless, driven out of Germany after being held by the Gestapo, almost killed, and is in France, stripped of her citizenship. And she said that when you create a legal and a physical mechanism by which a certain demonized or despised segment of the population is stripped of their rights. And here we can look at people of color who live in marginal communities, which has already happened to them, 
or what has happened to Muslim Americans in this country, especially since 9-11, then the moment that there is any kind of unrest, and she actually, one of the lines is, when you strip a certain segment of the population of their rights, you have stripped the entire population of their rights. So we already have the militarized police forces. We already have the laws in place by which Americans can have habeas corpus, due process taken from them. Indeed, the federal government can decide to assassinate an American citizen. And you never want to give government that kind of power. Because if systems of power feel threatened, they will use it. And that's what's so frightening, that we already have built the mechanisms for very draconian forms of control, which a person who lives in a marginal community experiences day in and day out. For a nonviolent drug war, in the middle of the night, their door is kicked in, militarized police forces with long-barreled weapons, Kevlar vests, burst into the apartment, pointing weapons at children, terrorizing everyone inside, and drag someone away, and they've never committed a violent crime. And a night raid in East New York now looks no different from a night raid in Fallujah. And that's what happens when empires decline. They're hollowed out from the inside. So that the forms of control that are used on the outer reaches of empire migrate back to the heart of empire. Wholesale surveillance, drones, militarized police, indiscriminate use of lethal force, stripping away of any kind of legal protection. And this is not a new phenomenon. Thucydides wrote about it with the decline of Athenian democracy, that the Athens' decision to become an empire in the words of Thucydides, meant that the tyranny that Athens imposed on others it finally imposed on itself. And that's what's scary, because we've already reached a point where the government has all of the power it needs and all of the physical forces it needs should we become restive to do to us what is being done to those demonized elements within the society, and this is something that Aaron was acutely aware of. You're talking about um, this being a moment for revolution and, and a, a lot about the kind of revolution that everybody in this room would like to see. Um, but I did read uh, a piece of yours recently, I, I think it was an excerpt from the book, um, about this you know, time being ripe for revolution and that we don't know what kind of revolution that might be. And I'm wondering if you think given you know, the organization of the Christian right and the Tea Party versus the organization of the left in this country, you know, which revolution is more likely to actually come about? If you had to put money down, you know, it doesn't look good for us. But I think that that makes it even more imperative that we begin to stand up. And we are seeing movements stand up um, across the country. I mean, people talk about Occupy being dead. And this is really incorrect. Occupy was a tactic in the same way that when Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat, it was a tactic. Five years later, we had the Freedom Rides, which were a tactic. We have seen the tentacles of Occupy spread out. Whether it was Occupy Sandy, whether it's Black Lives Matter, whether it's Stop and Frisk, Debt Jubilee, I mean, it's there. And remember, it's, never, it's not covered by the state-controlled or the corporate-controlled media, which is completely oblivious to it. The real intellectual ferment and the real ideological debates take place totally off the radar of the establishment. And a small example of that would be I battled the Black Bloc um, during Occupy for many reasons. Um, and after 
Zuccotti was cut down, they were shut down, they, were, we, they organized a debate between myself and a black bloc leader in New York. Now this was an event that was not, the mainstream public didn't even know was happening. And yet the event drew hundreds of people, I mean the auditorium was completely packed, it was live streamed throughout the country, and it was a clash between myself, who feels that acts of vandalism and denigrating the police and carrying out so-called acts of violence is disruptive to the movement and those who feel that it furthers the movement. That's an extremely, it was an extremely important debate, but it was never seen by the outside society. And I think that that's what happens, as Berkman said, with invisible revolution, that you have a process by where the population loses its faith. And it is, it's important that it's, it loses its faith in the ideology that sustains the system, you know, whether that's the divine right of kings or whatever it is. And as soon as that ideology no longer has any currency, as Berkman points out, those systems of power can no longer function. So it's there, it's happening, it's move, it's, it's a, but it, you know, it's a, it's a force that is really, cannot be controlled by anyone. In the same way that Occupy just erupted. And something will erupt. I mean, as a reporter who's covered these movements, you know that it's set, that everything is set to go up. But you never know when, and sometimes these decayed systems have a far longer life expectancy than you expect. But as long as this corporate control state creates what in essence is political paralysis, the inability to respond to the, and the decision to extract greater and greater pounds of flesh from the populace, the more blowback is inevitable. But when, how, you never know. You never know, and, and even the purported leaders of the movement do not know. But that something is coming, having been in disintegrating societies much of my life, of that I have no doubt. Right. Okay. But it may be right. It may be a right wing, because it may be... What? And they are. And But of course, what they do is what fascist movements always do, is that they blame the vulnerable and crush them for their demise. I will just say, looking at the whole issue of the rise of the neo-confederacy in the South is illustrative, and I talk about it in the book. I'm, I go to Montgomery with Brian Stevenson, the great death row advocate attorney who's spent, he's an amazing man, has spent his life defending uh, people on death row or indigent, of course, black, usually, almost always. And when I'm in Montgomery, I put it in the book, we're walking through the streets of Montgomery and there's one Confederate memorial after another. And Brian says, all of these have been put up in the last 10 years. And they had just had a reenactment of Jefferson Davis's inaugural because Montgomery was the first Southern White House. So a bunch of white guys dressed up as Confederate soldiers and somebody dressed up as Jefferson Davis, half of Montgomery's black. And they rode through the street in a carriage and they played Dixie and raised the Confederate flag on the steps of the Capitol. And I said to Brian, oh, this is just like Yugoslavia. Because with the economic meltdown of Yugoslavia, everybody retreated into these mythic versions of who they, because it's all they had left. And in some ways, it's more dangerous than the era of Jim Crow, or because at that time period, you had poor whites who had work who were terrified that black people would take that work from them. But now they don't have work. And what they've done is what's happened in Yugoslavia is that they're blaming African Americans for destroying their country, which has been destroyed. And that's how fascism works. And that's why I think that the rise of the neo-confederacy and the kind of violence that we're seeing in Charleston and other places is emblematic of something that's even more frightening than we have dealt with in the past. I spoke in Charleston, by the way, a couple years ago. And the night before I gave my talk, or maybe it was right before my talk, I had dinner with the 
all of the professors and stuff who'd invited me. And I said, oh, I have an interesting connection with Charleston. I'm related to the Union general that captured Charleston. And they said, don't say that. Don't get up and say that. Don't mention that. Reactionary Republican Party. I don't understand. Right. The reactionary Republican Party, many, many of whose candidates are utterly unplugged from reality, achieve power. But the question comes down to this. By supporting an ineffectual liberal elite, ultimately, are we furthering the values that that ineffectual liberal elite claims to represent or diminishing those values by giving them credibility? And as we saw in Yugoslavia and also saw in Weimar, we saw a self-identified liberal elite as embodied in figures like Obama or Clinton that purportedly cared about liberal values but were unable to address the significant grievances and injustices that were visited on the working and the underclass. And then a crisis happened. And even the most sober business reporters like Gretchen Morgison are now talking about another financial meltdown, given that Wall Street is doing what it was doing before 2008. And at that moment, history has shown, and this was true in Yugoslavia, the backlash and the rage of the citizenry is directed at an ineffectual liberal elite. And they not only turn with venom on that elite, but they jettison the values that that liberal elite claims to represent. And at that point, you vomit up figures like Slobodan Milosevic, Radovan Karadzic, Franjo Tuzman, or in Weimar, the Nazi party. And that's why I supported NATO, because there has to be a force both political and social, within the culture that will not compromise on those values, that will stand up and fight for them, in effect articulating the values that these self-identified but bankrupt liberal elites claim to represent but in fact have sold out. And that's why, you know, for those of us who care about an open society, it's incumbent upon all of us to stand up now while there's still time and to carry out acts of sustained civil disobedience and mass protest that has at its core not only those values but the fundamental value of nonviolence. And if we don't do that, as this woman pointed out, we, we, we may very well end up with a species of American fascism. I think that's an appropriate place to end. But again, let's just send our gratitude.